walk with me down into my into my basement workshop and I'll give you a bit of a tour uh, as we walk through. So you see the, the granite foundation there, the poured concrete floor, and then what looks like somewhat cluttered and chaotic workspace. And I'd like to spend a little bit of time uh, explaining how that uh, how all this fits and, and comes together. So space, the first of the seven practical considerations, you need to think about access, awkward layout, obstructions, which are for sure present in a basement. You see that there's always going to be lally columns in the way or, or other structures. You're sharing a basement space. Typically, maybe you've got a washing machine down there or uh, for sure furnace or some other HVAC unit for your home. Uh, and then headroom as a practical consideration. So these were the stairs we just came down in my workshop. And what's what's unusual about my house is this staircase, as old as it looks, it's not original to the house. In fact, I can't quite figure out how it appeared there because up here you see that's actually a fireplace. So there obviously was floor across here and I've repurposed that fireplace as our wine storage rack. The other entrance I have to the house um, was a simple bulkhead that the level was about here and many years ago excavated down to the lowest level of the granite block foundation poured a new floor and built a, a set of stairs so that i could have a decent way to uh, bring materials into the shop and and come back out again uh, a few more words on that a little bit later uh, to show you how that works i also have a furnace it's a um, it's a high efficiency boiler it's a completely uh, self-contained, uh, no combustible, um, uh, done, no, no fresh air drawn from the basement. Everything is brought in from the outside and exhausted to the outside. So it's a completely self-contained unit. So I feel uh, pretty safe moving uh, equipment up close to that furnace. You can see here is the, the other side of the view, my bandsaw, the the, the backside of the bandsaw, which you're never accessing, uh, typically is up against the actually eight zones of heat uh, that we have in our house. Not that we have a huge house, I would say it's over zoned, um, but you could see it's a fairly complex array of, of plumbing and, and electrical work behind there. There's also three of these arch formations. Uh, it's a little bit difficult to see that this one's an arch, but if you follow the trace of my mouse, the, there's a brick structure in here that's shaped like this. This is how foundations were built for the big heavy chimneys in, uh, in older antique homes um, as, a, as a solid foundation above here on the first floor and the ground floor was a big walk-in um, a uh, big walk-in cooking fireplace and um, on the back side of that is the fireplace where you saw my my wine rack so it, it presents you with these interesting structures right in the middle of the workshop that you need to work around fortunately this one i turn into my mainly into my clamp storage uh, area and, and small little bits of hardware uh, in storage in there so to give you that perspective again, to go from my workshop um, to get back up to the house, that's a, a chest freezer that we use in the house. Uh, it's just to climb up the stairs. And there again is that wine rack sitting above uh, that, that odd structure. Next consideration I mentioned is an important one, lighting. And uh, my theme, just like uh, you heard with um, Michael Hartman Haney is uh, lighting, LED and lots of it. I uh, considered quite a bit um, the discussion of the Kelvin color temperature range um, and lots of ongoing discussions around what to use. I, I did this on myself with uh, materials and fixtures that I bought from uh, the big box. In fact, I bought my, my, all of my lighting supplies at Lowe's uh, at the time. When I first installed this lighting, there still wasn't a lot of knowledge and experience um, with LED lights, but they were finally becoming um, quite cost accessible uh, to put light in. 
and with the offset in the in the energy savings, it, it really is an efficient way to to provide a lot of light in your workspace. I had chosen based on my own research and reading a color temperature of 5,000. Michael had mentioned earlier that um, there has been growing discussion amongst um, ophthalmologists uh, starting to wonder about um, and study the effects of all of this LED light that we're using that's typically emitting a lot of blue light and questions about how that's impacting your retina. So um, even though I'm giving my recommendation, I chose 5000, which gives a, to me a very accurate color representation in my basement. I would encourage you to, uh, to do a little bit of research and reading on, um, on where the ophthalmology community is on, on what is idea to see um, uh, in terms of, of lighting. So here from sitting low on my floor, looking up in the ceiling, you could see that I have used uh, four foot double bulb um, old fluorescent fixtures where I purchased replacement T8, I think they're T8, uh, LED bulbs. And again, my, my color temperature selection was, uh, was 5,000. So each one of these fixtures has, uh, has two um, uh, four foot long bulbs in it. And in my workbench area, I have three of them placed over um, uh, across the area of the workbench. So I don't have any casted shadows. I have really broad uh, diffuse light. I have another unit there and one just over here as well. So I've got five of these fixtures all providing a lot of light around uh, the workbench. And I think for those of you that have come to um, uh, any of the small meetings in my workshop, it's a fairly comfortable, um, well-lit workspace where you don't really realize that you're uh, in a basement. In those areas where I couldn't necessarily fit larger fixtures, I also had purchased these um, uh, shop light fixtures. Again, I chose purposely 5,000 Kelvin um, lighting uh, for these so that I had consistent color lighting. I could locate them in the right task areas. Here's um, one here that's near my jointer and planer, another one near my bandsaw, another one near my lathe. So I have uh, sufficient task lighting in my, in my basement. Next is equipment. How the heck do you get that equipment in? It has to fit. Um, your space limits your selection. And of course, you need to get that equipment down into the basement. Central for me was um, a really good quality cabinet saw. So I um, invested um, a while back in a, uh, this is a five horsepower uh, industrial cabinet saw from SawStop, uh, the exact one that I have in my basement, and I, I couldn't be more pleased in a in a choice of a um, of a table saw. Not just because of its uh, its SawStop uh, safety protection, but its mass, your ability to precisely align things with the, the table saw makes a huge difference in producing accurate work. So uh, that was really a central piece for me. And there you see that that um, uh, table saw in my workshop. And one thing, as I start to show you some of my equipment, you'll notice that everything I have is on wheels. It's all relocatable or adjustable. So if I need to put a bigger piece of plywood on this side, I can simply step, push down on this hydraulic lift, move the table saw over, make the cuts that I need, and then go back to you. So uh, go back to the, um, uh, to being out of the center of view here. So you'll notice in all of these that um, uh, all of my tools here are on uh, relocatable wheels. This is a small um, uh, shaper table that I use essentially as a router table. Uh, I don't have a dedicated router table stand um, and I've been very happy with using a, um, a smaller shaper specifically for uh, specific uh, routing tasks. Uh, that works out really well. This is an important piece of um, of equipment in my workshop and I, I I chose one. It's a it's a 12 inch wide jointer planer combination. It's a European made model. 
And uh, this is the, the unit set up in its standard uh, jointer mode with a, a solid right angle fence, two great heavy uh, beds here, the ways of the joiner and tw a full 12 inch of width on this uh, joiner, which I, I really appreciate um, having. At the same time, those two tables lift out of the way, you flip over the dust collection hood here, and that same cutter head that's your joiner cutter head becomes the planer um, cutter head as well. So you feed wood in this side um, and the processed wood is flowing out this side. So same cutter head, but going underneath it. So when you're um, stuck with space, a combination machine like this, allows you to get a, a very large capacity machine uh, into the basement. And yes, getting this down in the basement was clearly a challenge. And the way I did it was I, I took off the heavy pieces one by one. So take this table off, took this table off, um, was able to pull the motor out, and then I could more easily get the pieces down into the workshop uh, and reset back up again. Over here is my lathe and a few other uh, miscellaneous tools that you see uh, uh, scroll saw there, but laid is, uh, is a tool I, I really love to use. My inspiration from that, I honestly have to say, was, was John Siegel from um, the Guilds uh, when I first attended um, a, a meeting where he was uh, doing some um, lathe turning. I, I was really inspired and, and got into the lathe. I use it today mainly for spindle turning um, in more period style furniture projects, but I also for fun love to um, love to make bowls uh, on it as well. Finally, the other piece that you saw in the other shops, it's, it's really an essential piece is some type of a chop or miter saw. And I am a big fan of everything Festool, as you can see by the, the boxes of Festool smattered all over my workshop. It's a uh, it's an essential tool for breaking down stock, um, for squaring off edges, getting everything close to ready um, for furniture uh, making. So, I unfortunately I, I have a lot of other things going on in my space here. So I use these clamp roller stands on this purpose built tool bench here so that I can lay my uh, long stock against that. And this this could pull out, so I can easily cut across a 12 or 14 inch wide um, board laid across here. And I could fit that in a relatively small space. Another big consideration is workbench. Uh, and I mentioned it's, uh, it's the centerpiece of my workshop. It's uh, 75, I would easily estimate 75% of my time is spent at the workbench. And my workbench, because I can only fit one, I need to make it adaptable uh, to each task that I want. So in my case, I am using a Soberg's heavy, it's their elite uh, bench top. And I am not using the base um, that you get when you purchase this workbench. I, I really love that it's made with European beets. It's a four inch thick top. It's, it's very heavy, a lot of mass to it. And I use these adjustable height leg stands made by um, a guy, I think it's the, Noden is his last name. I think it's Jeff Noden, if I remember correctly, called an adjuster bench. And um, I'll show you a couple pictures here. Here's the here's side view of the bench. I have some accessory small uh, bench that I, I might put this up on top to raise up something for carving. Here is a um, uh, another small bench top uh, bench that I use for working on um, inlaid uh, legs of uh, tables and so on and so forth. But all generally settled uh, around this area of my workbench. Um, just like Michael Hartman Haney, I also have a passion for old antique uh, tool chests. This is uh, one that I, I restored a number of years ago. So here you could see the adjustable bench set in a very low position, which is really ideal for hand planting wood. And um, on a project um, I've been working on, a lot of the boards were far too wide to go through my uh, jointer and planer. So I did a lot of it by hand and being able to lower the bench so you get more leverage on your hand planting is a big help with this bench. But at the same time, I can raise it up 
a foot, uh, almost a foot and a half if I go up to full extension uh, so that my bench ends up becoming as high as chest high if I'm really working on something fine detail. So here, you know, in, in setting up for doing some carving on a panel, uh, I can raise the bench to the height that I, that I want. So really convenient to have something of so much mass on such a sturdy base platform uh, that's height adjustable. I, I highly recommend something like that uh, when you can really only afford to fit one workbench in your workshop. Here it's serving as a, as a staging area for rough, uh, rough lumber. Uh, this is just absolutely beautiful mahogany um, that dates back to the Townsend document chest uh, project done by the Period Furniture Group. Now, now that must have been eight or nine years ago already. Uh, that's, that's one project I've been working on recently in my workshop. Another consideration is humidity. It's bad for your tools, it's bad for the wood, um, and it's bad for you. Bad for you, particularly in terms of um, uh, mold and mildew growth that, that can easily happen in, in basements. And if you're spending a lot of time down in your basement workshop, you don't wanna be breathing that in, let alone the sawdust. And if you're a hand tool, um, uh, worker like um, like many of us on this this call are you you have a significant investment in hand tools and an investment in keeping them sharp and precise keeping them in a basement where they just sit and quickly start to to rust is uh, um, is obviously something that you really need to deal with up front in my case I keep several monitors where I'm, I, I I'm lucky I'm able to regulate the temperature quite well um, in my basement and keep an eye on the relative uh, the relative humidity. That is thanks to a commercial uh, dehumidifier. I, I used to run two or three of the typical Home Depot 100 pint um, type dehumidifiers and found that they could never keep, even having three machines, they could never keep up with the amount of humidity um, in an old New England basement. So I went to a commercial uh, unit like this. It's a low temperature dehumidifier, which means it will auto defrost if you start to build up frost on the coils. And if, you're, if your ambient temperature in your basement is below 60, it gets a little difficult to pull moisture out um, on the relative humidity scale. So you need one that works at a low temperature. I have uh, one here, um, George Adams also has one uh, from a similar company, Santa Fe, that makes these commercial uh, lower temperature dehumidifiers. I have a condensate pump with mine, which pumps water out. You, you can measure the output of this in gallons per day, not pints per day with the commercial units. And this one um, unit covers my entire basement. I keep my relative humidity set it's a little hard to read that screen. It says RH47. My setting is at uh, somewhere between 45 and 50. Uh, my goal is to not let the relative humidity get above 50 uh, in my workshop. And so there you can see it set up there, um, blowing air across the shop out to where my workbench area is. Another piece that I'm really fortunate to have is a zone of heat in my basement. I was given a couple of old cast iron radiators and it turns out to be relatively inexpensive to add one more zone of heat. People can't give their radiators away so it was easy to find um, some that a neighbor had that they were getting rid of. So for the cost of a little bit of, um, of plumbing um, and a new pump, um, circulator pump um, and simply adding another zone in your furnace gives me my own zone of heat down in the basement so I can keep a, a relative uh, constant temperature throughout the year. Being a hand tool um, uh, person, I love to work with hide glue. And generally speaking, hide glue works best when you're in a workshop uh, where the temperature is uh, probably closer to 70 degrees on, a, on an average 68 to 70 degrees um, so that you have enough open time with your glue. And this, uh, there's one radiator here and a second one behind it. So it's probably six feet of radiator space does an amazing job at, at keeping a constant temperature in my basement. Materials, how do you get raw materials in? 
inventory and storage and finished projects out. In my case, I showed you, I have a staircase that comes down from the main house. And I also have this bulkhead area, but where uh, storage is at a limit for me, I made my uh, bulkhead stairs on hinges, in fact, so it, it's heavy, but I can lift this up and I have a compressor in there that I use for um, feeding compressed air to the outside for filling car and bike tires. I have a, a vacuum cleaner under there. So I'm constantly looking at how I can save uh, space and eliminate as much clutter as possible in the workshop. So that turned out to be an interesting idea, plus the fact that I can pull these stairs out and use something to chain hoist up or down a piece of heavy equipment uh, into the basement as well uh, with my bulkhead fully open here. So with what seems like a relatively restricted uh, space, I'm actually able to get fairly heavy equipment down in and back out again. Here's a quick video to show you what that, um, what that experience looks like to walk from my um, uh, workbench over to uh, the exterior uh, bulkhead door. So open up the door there uh, and you see the, the space. There is unfortunately um, a, a step up, which is the height of one big granite block into that space. So the first step is about 18 inches. But just unfortunately, no way that I could uh, overcome that. Lumber storage. Any of us um, need to deal with how we're going to store our lumber. Uh, in the case of uh, George and Michael, they showed you a little bit of, of their wood storage capability. They have very high ceiling height, nine foot plus ceilings. And here's a great image of, of um, uh, George's um, uh, lumber inventory. He's got it marked. He's got it all stacked vertically and easily accessible. Over here to the right, I'm not sure who this picture can, might have been from uh, Brad's uh, space, uh, taking advantage of overhead space uh, in a basement, which is also something that I do is really helpful. You can fit quite a bit of lumber up there between the top, um, uh, between the, the floor joists and your space. So all shorts and you know, here you can see two or three inch wide pieces, uh, three or four feet long, uh, are make it really easy to store up overhead there. In my workshop, all of my storage is horizontal because I don't have the ceiling height. I'm at maybe 6'2 or 6'3 um, would be where those copper pipes are. And then to these Joists up there would be six six or so or six seven. So I don't have um, very tall clearance. So all of my storage is on purposed lumber racks. Um, this lumber rack is on wheels here. I can move it around. This is where I store my veneers and sometimes some shorter scraps. Again, it's on a cart um, that encourages a lot of airflow and uh, is on wheels so I can move it around. I also have an old um, antique uh, shoe rack here that I use to let um, turns uh, bowls dry on. Again, I can move that out of the way to get at these shelves here. So another place that I use for storage is under the workbench. And here is where I keep all of my Baltic birch um, stock. I start with five by five sheets that can fit down in my basement and then I tend to section that up into smaller pieces um, of varying thicknesses. So I have an inventory of, of um, uh, Baltic birch uh, that, I, that I store horizontally under my workbenches there. I also label and store a lot of items in, uh, uh, in these plastic containers. So here you can see is one marked for marquetry. So within there, I would have my um, uh, my scroll saw blades, all of the, the my little surgical scalpel knife that I use, everything relating to um, uh, making uh, patterai or inlays and in furniture. I keep all of those small hand elements there. Here's gloves, here's hardware for boxes, and so on and so forth. Finally, uh, we come to the, the topic of hazards in the workshop. We were initially going to cover this in more detail, and as mentioned earlier, George um, and, and Michael and the, and the team have uh, 
decided that we didn't want to just gloss over this subject. Um, we'd rather treat it with more care and importance. But I would say in, in my case, safety and hazards is, is constantly in the front of my mind. This, by the way, this tool chest was my great grandfather Alfred's tool chest, uh, one of them that I inherited. So we'll cover these extra topics here, um, but there are a few that were very important for me. Dust removal uh, to me is one of the number one hazards. And um, as as Michael mentioned uh, with his wife that's a, a physician, he understands pretty clearly the damage that can happen in breathing in super fine particles. I unfortunately, when I got going with this, didn't have an appreciation for that. And I was working with... Uh, uh, beautiful wood called lace wood and was building a clock for my mother-in-law's uh, retirement party and ended up, unfortunately, I didn't know at the time, but I ended up developing a, a really severe reaction uh, to lace wood dust and the fine particles that that's so easy to breathe in. And I had a systemic uh, inflammatory response, um, ended up on steroids for uh, nearly three months to try to get that under control. So, um, pay close attention to whatever you can do for dust collection. Beware of static electricity. Uh, again, we'll, we'll cover these in more detail on a separate meeting, but I, I didn't want to just leave you without um, the constant awareness of all of that great duct work. If you're not running medical metal duct work um, and instead you're running plastic hoses like you saw um, in my shop or in, in Brad's or PVC, um, the static potential buildup in that is tremendous as you're pulling large chunks of sawdust out of your joiner or planer through it. Um, you know, I've always read about that, but never really thought, oh, static electricity, what's it a little, yeah, it can't be that bad. Well, one time a few months ago, I was running boards through my joiner um, and I backed my back into my flexible dust hose and I thought I got hit with a baseball bat. It's it's something I've never experienced before, such a powerful static discharge to my back. I felt like I was struck by lightning. So something that you do need to take seriously and we look forward to devoting a bit more time on all of these critical safety topics. So finally, to try to put all that together, I'll give you a bit of a um, walkthrough here. So you can see all of the elements of, of a basement workshop all put together. So you see there on the right was a moving cart that I keep my uh, project um, uh, able to move around the shop. My hand tool storage there, that uh, you see there is the, an antique tool chest uh, that I had restored that was a journeyman's tool chest. My workbench set up with those adjustable legs again. You'll see nearly everything is on legs. My table saw set up. Over to the jointer and planer, you get a sense for the advantage of the, the size of a four by four. There's my lumber storage area with shorts I store vertically. Um, these are the smaller, somewhat more portable tools. My drill press, one of my several shop vacs, um, and uh, a hollow chisel mortiser. There's that access to the outside. Again, now you see the um, the jointer, the planer. There's the dehumidifier. In fact, if you can hear the sound, it's it's running in the background to give you a sense of how loud it is with its own condensate pump. Uh, there's my lathe set up and I, I did clean up for this photo. There's normally a lot of shavings there. Uh, my bandsaw, a secondary smaller table saw that I use for really fine, uh, precise slicing work in the veneer work that I like to do. Uh, there's my veneer uh, storage shelves that I can move around. My um, uh, lumber, uh, main lumber storage area there for the longer material and then the shorts I keep vertically uh, as well. This is all the duct work uh, inventing for my, my uh, heating system. And then finally down in the back of the workshop, I'm really lucky I have my own sink area. 
and you see the, the storage shelves that I use um, with task-oriented storage um, items in there labeled. So if I'm working on a particular project, I can go pull just that one box and all of the, the small um, bits and pieces that you use with that are all accessible together and I know quickly where I could find them. And there's my, my latest project there uh, on the left. And finally, I look into this um, uh, archway. Now you can see the sense of the archway uh, that supports a massive chimney uh, and fireplace up over it. So even though it's a small space overall, you're really able to maximize your use of it with things being portable and, um, and take advantage of the, the space that you have.